lovers woo. They still say I love you, and that you can rely. No matter what the future brings, as time goes by. I'm really happy to have with us today David Whalen. David Whalen's been broadcasting locally forever, I think. Seems uh, like it. Let's start off, Dave, uh, with some of your personal background. Where were, were you born, raised, that kind of thing? I uh, actually lived in Binghamton my whole life, Bob. Uh, I was born in the First Ward. Uh, Slovak family, Slovak and Irish. My dad was Irish and my you know, mom's Slovak. We lived on a street called Rogers Street, which no longer exists. It was a dead end. Went from Clinton Street down to the railroad tracks, south to the railroad tracks, and was right across the street from the Union Hotel, which is still there oh, today. Yeah. Um, and uh, when I was four, we moved to Saratoga Terrace, the housing project. Uh, didn't have a lot of money in the family, and uh, it was a great place to uh, to grow up. Uh, lived there until 63, always a lot of kids around to play and whatnot. Moved to the west side. Uh, I went to West Junior, then to Central High School. Uh, then Broom Community College was Broom Tech back then. And then I wanted to be the next Howard Cosell, so I wanted to go to uh, a broadcasting career. Let me go back just a little bit. Yeah. What did you study at Broom? At Broome, I took liberal arts because I didn't really know, I don't know what I, what I was going to do. Uh, it was the height of the Vietnam conflict, uh, so you really had a choice at that time, either further your education uh, or go in, into the armed services. Uh -huh. And no member of my family had ever, gone to, I had ever graduated from college. My older brother went but didn't graduate. My mom went through eighth grade uh -huh. uh, and then uh, left school to work uh, to help the family, uh, nine children. And then... Uh, my dad went to 11th grade and went to Bingham Central but never graduated. So I took the opportunity to go to Broom Tech and uh, immediately flunked out. Oh, well. Flunked out. <clears throat> and uh, I, was, I was smart but didn't apply myself very well. Uh, I had basically a D average in high school but had 1,200 on my college boards. There so you go. The late John Lolly was the counselor at the time and he called me in and said to me, uh, I've got your college board scores here. And I said, okay. He says, you know you had almost a 1,200. And I said, is that good? Yeah, yeah. Good. He yeah. said, you've obviously, you've obviously had a good time here at Central High School. I said, yeah, I have. He said, well, it shows. You're a great stink, but you're a smart kid. So anyway, uh, I went back to Broome, uh, applied myself a little more fervently, uh, and then transferred to the University of Florida. I got accepted to Florida and Florida State. Wanted to go where it was warm. Uh, I lasted just over a week. Whoops. I was in Yulee Hall, where they took all the northern boys. It uh, was a six-story high-rise, the oldest building on campus, no air conditioning. And I was on the top floor. If you could, it was like living in an oven. You would literally take a shower before you could dry your feet. The sweat was pouring down your face. And they said originally they'd accept all my credits, change their mind. So it had about three years instead of two. So I'm out of here. I transferred to Oswego State. So you talk about <laughs> diametrically opposed climates. Extreme, University right? of Florida, Gainesville, Oswego State, Oswego, New York. And uh, the reason I chose Oswego was the only state school that had uh, radio and television major. Uh, the other schools in New York at the time were Ithaca College, Syracuse, and Columbia, none of which I could afford. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to Oswego State, graduated, and uh, the rest is kind of history. Wow. The rest is history. Yeah, so, so to speak. So you, got, you had uh, a degree in radio and television? Correct. Okay. Communications major, Oswego. It was a great school. Uh, the weather was brutal. Yeah. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of big snowfalls. We had three six-foot snowfalls in two did years. Did you really do any part-time stuff? I did not. Oh. I did not because... I was at the time working for Mike Podoski, uh, the garbage man. He did all of Endicott Johnson's garbage. I never went to school on a Friday when I was at Oswego. I had a four-day class schedule. I worked every Friday and Saturday on the garbage truck, and then drove back to Oswego right. Sunday night or Monday, depending on the weather, and that helped pay my way through college. So uh, so you went through through high school uh, working also? I, my, my last year in high school, uh, Mike hired me uh, to do cindering. He used to do the whenever it snowed. Uh, he would cinder off the back of an open uh, dump truck the Endicott Johnson parking lot so that the employees could get to work and didn't melt anything but it gave him traction. So I was the shovel guy. And I would take up my glasses, I'd look like a raccoon, just <laughs> covered with soot yeah. and whatnot. And from there I got uh, elevated to not only doing the uh, cindering but also working on the back of the garbage truck. Okay. And I was, uh, <laughs> and I was uh, pinned up against an Endicott Johnson factory wall by a 28-ton truck. And uh, that was between my stint at Florida and, and starting at Oswego. Oh, wait a minute. How did that happen? We did garbage during the day with these big Brockway trucks that we would back into. And one of the factories was the Scout Factory. It was kind of across the road, across the viaduct from uh, the J.C. Pavilion. 
And at the end of the day, we do all the garbage, we go to the landfill, and we'd come back and do leather scrap that we would take to what was then Stamen Industries. And uh, a lot of the, you couldn't get in there exactly squarely because of a big fire apparatus. So the truck was kind of a little bit of an angle scrap, but fall on the ground. So Frankie Zietz, God rest his soul, was the driver. He pulled away about eight, ten feet, and I would clean up all the leather scrap because Mike got very upset if we left it a mess. And for some reason, instinct, I just turned around and the truck was right there, just rolling towards me. And I, one hand on the loading dock, one hand on the truck, and I just jumped up. Didn't quite make it and kind of pinched my legs together. Uh, could have lost them, but fortunately there was just enough of an angle that it kind of squished them and didn't cut them off. So that was the end of my army career. I, I actually uh, was drafted shortly thereafter, failed the physical miserably, and uh, went to Oswego. So, so what, did you break a leg? Or? Nope, just uh, crushed. I still have uh, a lack of, of some feeling in the, in the left knee area where the, the nerves were all crushed. Had a massive hematoma. My leg was bigger than my waist. That was drained and uh, became a runner subsequently and did that for a lot of years until so the left knee finally just right? went out. Wow. So you didn't do sports in college? Didn't do sports in college. Uh, came out of there, and actually my first sports experience, I was my brother and I owned a bar uh, called the Stadium Bar at the time, and I uh, got a gig working as the public address announcer for the Dusters. Uh, Harold Gladstone was a good friend of Jimmy Matthews. He was doing the PA at the time. Uh, we were going to games. Of course, Duster mania hit town. Oh, yeah. Couldn't get a ticket, uh, so I actually scrubbed together some money, did, uh, bought season tickets, and... Uh, I was listening to the guy, and a couple of friends of mine said, Motor, which is my nickname for obvious reasons. Uh, Motor, you could do better than that guy. I said, well, I mean, he's a friend that you made. But Harold had a very, very bad heart, a uh, very bad heart condition. And, and toward the end of the second season, he couldn't continue. Uh, and so I had expressed some interest in it. And Paul Brown was there at the time, and he, he gave me a shot, and I did it for about 20 years. No. Okay, so this is right out of college? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Wow. Pretty much right out of college. Yeah, yeah great. So it was, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. In those days, it was the building was full. It was rocking. You had, you know, oh, yeah. crazy people playing. You, had, yeah. you know, you had the guys from, from Johnstown and, and uh, the Carlson right. brothers who were a little bit wacky. And, <laughs> a lot. And we had, you know, Goldie Goldthorpe Gold playing for yeah. us for a while who was wacky. Yeah. He actually cracked my ribs with a water bottle. He got so upset. He was, he was a lunatic. I came in the penalty box and flung the water bottle that was full and hit me right in the ribs. Oh. Threw a stick another time and hit me in the face. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I wasn't real happy with Goldie Goldthorpe. He wasn't my favorite player. Well, was it better to have him on our team or Syracuse? Our team. He was, everybody in the league was afraid the guy was nuts. Yeah. He could fight. I mean, yeah. I, I was at the arena the night that he jumped. He was playing for the, the opponents. I think it was with Syracuse maybe at the time. And I believe it was Syracuse. And he was suspended again and was in a sport coat and loafers in a, in a pregame fight and soon he climbed over the glass onto the ice and started decking guys in a pair of loafers. The other guys were on skates and had traction. Tough guy. Oh. Tough guy. You mentioned motor mouth. Yeah, that's me. How did you get that? My brother, 1964, on a trip to Florida, driving. Uh, I can't use the adjective he used that preceded motor mouth, but he asked me to please shut up. Please. And I was a blank motor mouth. I was with some friends in the car. It stuck. I've been that. Uh, motor or motor mouth. That, that doesn't bother you. No, it doesn't bother you. There are a lot of people that really don't know my first name is David. Oh, so Correct. They just motor? know me as Motor. <laughs> yes, motor. My, my, my nephews and nieces call me Uncle Motor. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So, so you're, uh, you were unique. You really ate that stuff up if you were in there. I loved it. Yeah. It was, it was fun to be a part of. Uh, I was a high school football official at the same time. So, I, oh. you know, I love sports. Well, how did you get... All right, let's jump over that. Okay, high school football. How did you football? get to be a, a, a high school football official? Well, I always loved the game of football. I wasn't very big. I liked to play. I only got as far as JVs. And, uh, but I loved the game of football. And I was working uh, for a while at the press for Frank Generelli. Uh, wow. God rest his soul. Frank was circulation director. And Frank was a football official. And he was talking to my brother, older brother and I. He said, you know, we need some younger guys to get involved in football officiating. And I thought, why not? You know, you get a couple of bucks. I think we got $12 a game back then. Uh -huh. right? And, uh, but if you love the game of football, it was a way of being part of the game. Uh, and, and it's a crucial part of the game. Without officials, you don't have a game. And I did that for close to 20 years as well until my kids started playing. How did you learn all the rules? You study. Uh, you get the rule book, you study, you have to take tests. Uh, you have to take tests annually. Uh, and you get on the field with scrimmages. And, you know, we even work peewee games for nothing to learn your trade. Mm -hmm. uh, but I loved officiating. And I still miss it to this day. But once my boys started playing, uh, I really wanted to be part of their football careers and watching them play, so yeah. that 
depressing. Well, it was, it gives you a lot of exercise. It was great. I was in a lot better shape than I'm in today. A lot of running, and I really loved it. It was great. Didn't being a lot of the other people would yell at you. Oh, they called me some terrible things. Even good friends, kids I grew up with, like Hank Nanny, who was coaching for Binghamton at the time, uh, he called me all sorts of horrible names. Um, every time I'd miss a call, he'd let me know what under know in certain terms. Fran Angeli was pretty tough. Yeah, uh, Bart Gusha, Union Etiquette, the whole Union Etiquette staff were known as uh, as pretty uh, vocal individuals. But I loved it. Loved it. When you make it. When you made a mistake, did you admit it or just go on with the game? Sometimes you'd admit it. Sometimes you'd hang your head. Sometimes you'd say, look, I blew the call. Uh, other times you'd miss it and say, geez, did I see it? You'd second guess yourself after the fact. I mean, you've got that much to make a decision, and you're doing the very best you can. You hope you're in the right angle, but sometimes you miss it. Okay, so I'm trying to get this picture here. Mm -hmm. you're, you're the PA announcer. Correct. For, for the Dusters. Right. And you're doing some football officiating. Football officiating, yeah. What did you do for a living? I was working at the press at the time. My brother and I owned a bar. That went under. We didn't do well. I took a job with Frank Generale at the press in the circulation department. Okay. And really that led me uh, to what was then Empire Pioneer Cable TV, which was had been purchased by new channels but hadn't changed its name uh, uh -huh. because they didn't want to do things too rapidly. Uh, Jimmy Generale, Frank's brother, wonderful man, was in the uh, sales department at the press. And one of his accounts was... Empire Pioneer Cable TV, which was run at the time by Clark Cook, mm -hmm. name you know well. Mm -hmm. Second in command was Jim Streeby. They were looking for someone to start up a door-to-door -door sales team. They really, new channels really wanted to start getting into the marketplace and selling cable television to the populace. Mm -hmm. uh, I had some experience with that at the press, taking paper, newspaper carriers out to sell. Uh, so Jimmy said, hey, there's a guy I know who's got a great personality. He's got some experience with this. You should talk to him. So I went down and interviewed with Clark and with Jim. They then sent me to Syracuse to interview with a guy named Bob Myron, a little short guy, who I had no idea who he was. Uh, Bob Myron is a legendary genius in the cable television world. Genius, and I say that with all due respect. Uh, Bob and his second in command was Joel Fleming. They gave me a shot, they hired me. Uh, May 2nd, 1977, down on Stage Road, I made my first appearance, uh, running, a, uh, running New Channel's very first door-to-door -door sales team. What was uh, what was Clark Cook like to work? Clark was a you know this it's really a funny story. Clark and I laughed about it many many times over the years till his passing here in the last year. Uh, but he, I always said to him, Clark, you had the good sense. The day I arrived was your last day with the company, and he had he'd gone off and, and did very well at WKOP and he owned uh, you know building some company and, and and worked with his boys. So Clark left the day I got there. Oh yeah. Clark, Clark once told me that that. Um, one thing he didn't like about the cable business was getting phone calls at 10 o'clock at night, people saying, my picture isn't very good, or you know, what happened to my signal? I, at that time, I guess those guys were real pioneers. They I were guess. real pioneers. They I were, mean, like door to door, putting it, stringing up the oh, cable. That's what we were doing. I mean, it was Vestal Video, which was on the Vestal side, obviously, Pioneer, which is over in Endicott, and Empire down in Binghamton. Uh -huh. And Jim Streeby ran Empire, and when the entities came together, it was Clark and Jim, assimilating the, the separate companies together mm -hmm. uh, under obviously the masthead of new channels uh, and it was you know it was it was interesting because we had 10 channels of cable and this new thing called home box office uh -huh. which today is HBO uh -huh. but I can remember people back in that day saying I want the home box and that's what people refer to the home box uh -huh. and it was a box with a button uh -huh. to get your uncut uncensored which was unique back then yeah. so that was in 77 they reached seven bucks those days are gone. Can't beat that. No, you can't. <laughs> Three channels from New York, a couple from Syracuse, the local channels. And, that was and it. Actually, when it came down to it, the signal wasn't all, all that great. At no, that time. it wasn't. It, but it, you were happy to be able to see WPI. Actually, it, I so. think that was the biggest draw. was the New York channels. Yeah. And I remember as the New York channels many, many years ago started going away, there was a, yeah. a hue and cry. Uh, it was a legacy issue. You uh, you worked for Jim Streeby. I did. Uh, he was, a, he was uh, my mentor for many years. Okay. What would you think of Jim? Jim was a straight shooter. Here's a guy who came up through the ranks. Uh, what you see was what you got. He didn't polish the edges. Uh -huh. He could tell you, and sometimes it didn't mean to come out the way it came out, but you got the message pretty quickly. Uh, but he was a very smart guy. He was a self-made man. Um, you know, really did it on his own. Uh, learned a lot about the business. Uh, early riser, worked hard. Uh, he'd stand in that window close to 8 o'clock, tap it on the window if you were 30 seconds late. Like, oh, you know, well. he saw you coming in 30 <laughs> seconds late. He was, uh, uh, he'd been in the, in the military, so he was a real, you know, 
real straight shooter, but he's a good guy to work with. We socially we became very good friends. Uh, we all became part of the Y guys. A whole group of us ran at the Y. And I remember when I started at New Channels, I think I weighed about uh, 220 pounds. Oh, how um, oh, tall are you? Yeah. I was 5'9 then, probably 5'8 today at age yeah. 64. Yeah. Uh, but I became a runner at the Y and uh, ended up went, getting my weight down to 170. And I'm about 174 today, so yeah. that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. So we all uh, got together socially with Bill Lane and uh, William H. Lane was part of our group of runners. Uh, Bill is 20 years older than I am and looks better than I do. He's in uh, great shape, still plays softball. So that was the group. And so Jim and I became good friends. And When you started with... New I channels. guess, new channel. Well, even new Empire Portland. Pioneer Cable TV, okay. officially. When you started, how many subscribers were there? Now, I know you guys are going door to door to sign up people. And, uh, I would say 30 some thousand. Um, Today, 60,000. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah. Here in the Triple Cities area. Well, and you have less population today. Uh, true. Yeah. True. But of course, you know, one of the things. I, I got to see the advent of the whole business. And I remember we, we, we launched the product. We launched our very first cable store, which was down in the uh, about a half mile west of the Oakdale Mall, what we call the small mall, where Robson Electric was. We had a cable store where people would come in and pick up equipment. We had a new product called Cable Extra. Both Sifers fight over the name. Marketing people want to call it Cable Extra because it was extra channels. Other people didn't want to call it Cable Extra because Cable Extra was extra money as well. So it was quite an interesting fight. It ended up being cable extra. Right. You got ESPN, MTV, CNN, some of those were channels. Were you involved were in some of those discussions? Or? Yeah, I was involved in all of them. It was, it was was pretty, yeah, yeah. And what was your title at that time? I was I went, I was originally uh, handling door to door sales, mm -hmm. and then I got into marketing. And I actually, uh, along with another guy, were co managing the cable store. Uh, got involved in marketing. I became marketing direct manager uh, along the way, um, and we did that for a lot of years. And the cable product was starting to move along, and then. There was a product you'll remember, Telepress, the newspaper Tele channel. Oh, I Telepress remember it today. Well. I hosted the, <laughs> I hosted the classified ads. There show. you go. <laughs> well, that was a partnership between Cadet Newspapers, the Binghamton Press, and uh, new channels, uh, and we each put up, I think, the princely sum of a hundred thousand dollars or something, uh, uh, and and we're running this channel. And David Rossi was on it. The sports guys were on it. it was a, yeah. it was a pretty interesting local channel. I wasn't making any money. Yeah. There's one thing that Bob Myron was very yeah. very good about was trying to look at something and saying, okay, it's a wonderful thing. How do we make money with it? Because at the end of the day, you know, that's what you have to do. You have to turn a profit. And, and his way to do it was to buy the press out, bring it back in house. Uh, the Walsh brothers, who you're familiar with, yep. Walsh Construction had purchased the Scotch and Sirloin building, was refitting it. They created a studio there as well as an insertion site. And we began to sell advertising on cable television, which literally had never been done. And I remember my friend Joe McNamara, who I'm still friendly with, and Joe's over in Hawaii, but Joe was the sales manager at WBNG at the time. And he said, they won't last four months. That was, uh. <laughs> that was in, uh, well, I don't know, the, the late 80s, beginning 1990, around there, and it's still yeah. going today. Oh, so yeah. Joe's prognostication wasn't accurate, fortunately, because I'd have been out of a job. Yeah. But I was running that and did that for a whole bunch of years. And and that was that was great because we really so you so you uh, you you handled the the sales. I uh, had a sales staff that worked for me. Uh -huh. uh, Ken Harrison, you know well, oh, sure. was running the production side. Yeah. And and Ken handled the producers. We made all our own commercials, did a lot of promotions, right. uh, and really put cable television advertising on the map. Uh, we were new channels cable television ad sales was the name of the, of the yeah. group, and uh, did that for a number of years. And then in '95 we uh, were bought out by Time Warner Cable. Is it only 95? <laughs> Seems longer than that. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was 1995. Sorry. I'll never forget it. I was lying on the floor with a big pillow and a beer, getting ready to watch Sunday Night Football. The Giants were on that night. Uh, and I got a call from my boss, and she said, are you sitting down? I said, I'm better than that. I'm laying down. She goes, we just sold the Time Warner. I said, what's that mean? She goes, for me, I'm out. For you, you're fine. Uh, and I've been working for Time Warner ever since. That was it. 36 years total. But, and wow. that was it. It was that simple. We went through the transition. A guy named Tom Adams came in to run it. Uh, Tom had Tom was a local boy. Uh, went to Seton Catholic Central, went to Delhi, uh, worked for us, uh, went off in a bunch of positions, worked for us out in, uh, out in western Pennsylvania, worked for us down south. Uh, actually, I had been down south in his operation. We were in Montgomery, Eufaula, Greenville, and Anniston, Alabama. And I was down there for a couple stints, uh, for a couple weeks at a time. 
And then Tom came back to run it under the new channel's umbrella, or under the Time Warner umbrella. It was great. Compare the management uh, styles, starting back with Clark Cook, Jim Streeby, and, and up through uh, Time Warner. In the early days, it was much, well, far less people making decisions. You would get two or three people in a room, and they'd make a decision. Uh, you might hash over it for a couple of hours. I remember sitting in budget meetings, four or five people in the room, they would argue for an hour and a half over whether you needed that extra bucket truck or not. Uh, it was very, very different. And, and decisions were really local, a lot of local input, and very, very locally run company. I mean, New Channels was run out of Syracuse, so they were 70 miles away. Uh, you know, we had a funny thing, long distance charges would add up. So if you wanted to talk to Bob Myron, you would call, say, this is David Whalen with a collect call for Bob Myron. He would refuse the call, saying it wasn't in. And then he'd call you back on a Watts line. Why didn't you tell those? Because it was free. So, you know, it was that small. Uh, and then as, as we started to grow and the numbers got larger with larger subscriber bases, selling more products, uh, the numbers got bigger. And budgeting took a little more time, a few more people involved. And then Time Warner takes over, and it is light years. This is huge corporate budgeting. Every single penny is going into every single line item and everything. We used to spend months getting our budgets together. In the beginning, it took that long, and they were this thick. It was just incredible. But they knew where every penny was, uh, and it was very interesting. And what about the decision-making? Did that change? Well, it was, it was interesting. Binghamton was a division. At one point in time, Time Warner had 42 separate divisions. Each division was autonomous. Binghamton was a division, as was Syracuse, as was uh, Rochester. Each division had its own division president, had a series of vice presidents. Vice president, I was vice president of public and governmental relations, and we had a vice president of marketing, vice president of finance, vice president of HR. And everything was done, budgeted, all your finances were local, you cut your checks, you didn't actually print the check here, but you had all the paperwork, everything went in, went into the computer and the check was mailed. That has now changed. We were usurped by the Syracuse division, we merged. Now we are called One Time Warner. There is an East Coast and a West Coast. That's it. That's it. 42 divisions are no more. Two One divisions. time order. Yeah. Gigantic, uh, very well run company, uh, very good to the employees. I can say truthfully that I did far better financially under Time Warner than I did under New Channels. Oh. New Channels was a wonderful place to work. Time Warner rewards you more handsomely for your efforts. Yeah. Oh. And it's been great. I, I loved it. That's why I'm still doing it. People say, when are you going to retire? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And I like what I do. And I'm pretty good at it. So. Uh, Okay, so what about some of these the changes? Did was there a lot of resistance when you went from from the uh, one thing to another to another uh, technically? People don't like change. Right. People do not like change. Particularly the older people didn't like change, and we still have a lot of people now who don't have additional channels. They refuse to put a piece of equipment in their house. They just won't do it. Um, we are moving toward an all digital platform. Uh, as you know, we've been moving some channels to a digital platform already. Uh, and people say, well, why are you moving channels? What do you? It's very, very simple. Digital compression is huge in our industry. You cannot afford, we're a 750 megahertz system. Every analog channel takes up 5 megahertz of bandwidth. So divide 5 into 750, that's your maximum number of channels. When you go to digital, you can put anywhere from 8 to 15 channels in that same 5 megahertz slot. So what it did is allowed us to have over 100 high definition channels. But our, you know, our competitors, Dish and Direct TV, are completely digital. Without You don't put a piece of equipment in the house, you don't get anything. Well, come to think, you didn't used to have a satellite competition. No, no, we did not. Right. People say we're a monopoly. Not true, because you can franchise by federal law are not exclusive. And we have some areas in the Syracuse area where Verizon has cable television. Uh -huh. uh, they don't hear. Uh, quite frankly, their, their investment, the investment is enormous billions of dollars on, on enough capital investment to build and run one of these things. So you don't have somebody coming down the street saying, well, I'm going to put up $10 billion and put up a cable system in Binghamton, New York. It just doesn't happen. Oh. So that's why there's there's not another competitor here. Yeah, other than, obviously, the dishes came along. No. Uh, however, we have some significant advantages over the dishes, one of which is Roadrunner High Speed Internet. Uh -huh. and, and we should talk a little bit about that because the birth of Roadrunner's story. Uh -huh. uh, and we bundled our digital phone with free long distance with our internet and our digital cable to create these bundles at discounted prices that makes it very difficult for the dish people to compete. Um, 
Talk about some of the people you met and worked with over the years. You you were involved in all areas here. You were involved in government. You were involved in like the entertainment area. Correct. Uh, talk about some of that. Well, I, I've gotten to meet just so many interesting people, and, and I dealt with the broadcasters when I was in marketing, so I knew all of the people in all the television stations. Um, I was involved in government during our franchise renewal, so, you know, from, from the different mayors and supervisors and, and boards of trustees and city council members, uh, I, I, I got to know one, one of my fondest relationships is with Tom Levis, who was, uh, Tom was working with us when he was working for Johnson City Publishing, doing some printing for me uh, in, in my marketing position. He lived on the south side, I lived on the north side. Uh, I became co-chair of Democrats for Livis when he was running for city council, a uh, CT1. Uh, was on city council preparing to run for mayor when he got the call uh, from Warren Anderson to take his spot and run for state senator, position he's held uh, all these years. And I, I still have a wonderful relationship with Tom Boy. I have the utmost respect for as a person, just, a, just wonderful. Uh, and, and many other relationships, and in the broadcasting world. And not only that, because of our relationships, Everything was coming out of New York City at the time. Our HBO programming and, and, and all of our uh, great channels that were coming out of New York. And uh, I got a call the other day from a good friend of mine, Bruce Lippman, who I've known for 30 years, uh, who was with a number of He worked, used to work for Madison Square Garden. Bruce would invite my family every year on a trip to, to Yankees and Mets in Florida, paid for by MSG. Private parties with the Yankee players, signing autographs, posing for pictures. Fabulous. So it's just been, I've got to meet so many great people. It's just, just great. Well, so you were involved then in, uh, in negotiating the, the prices for with the, like the city council and uh, what, what do, uh, are there a lot of cities and villages that, that have a, a little video tax or, or franchise? Tax? Those are called franchise fees. We're required to have a franchise with every community. I manage 657 communities. Every one of them has a contract. Now? Now, today. You manage 657 communities. Central New York, Hudson Valley, Capital District, and Northern New Jersey. What do you do in your spare time? Um, <laughs> read about Notre Dame football, which is, <laughs> outside of my family, is my greatest passion in life. But uh, So, you know, you, you manage that, and, and what you're talking about is a franchise fee. Every municipality has the right to take up to a 5% fee on revenue that we collect for them, pass through to the customer. It's a line item on the bill. There's no hidden agenda here. The customer sees what they're paying. That money goes to the municipality. The money is huge. I mean, the city of Binghamton is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to go into those city coffers based on that franchise fee, which is, in essence, a, a tax. Do all of them have it? For instance, uh, Town of Union, Vestal? Uh... They all do. At one point, about 40% of our municipalities had a franchise fee. Today, it's probably closer to 80%. Really? Uh, you know, a lot of state mandates without state funding. A lot of communities are, are shrinking. Pensions are killing them. They're looking for every dime they can find, and some of the dimes they find uh, are the cable television dimes. As they say in Slovak, Dami Tapinyasi, give me your pennies, as my grandfather used to say to me. So <laughs> that's what they're saying to Time Warner, give me your pennies. I'll be darned. Uh, uh, I remember uh, probably in the 70s, maybe 80s, uh, when, when this would come before city council, mm -hmm. and the councilman would say, well, people have a choice. They can take it over the air. They can take it, uh, the, take the cable. So the councilmen were in favor of it. That brought money in. Correct. But it also didn't hurt. Um, people weren't weren't losing their their television. Well, it's not like electricity. I mean, I go far without electricity or heat. I mean, we were an optional service. But up until 1992, the municipalities could regulate what channels you carry, tell you what channels to put on or try to take off. And they had to approve your rate increases. I can remember going with Jim Streeby to public hearings where we would go and say, listen, we need a 25% rate increase. And we'd have to go back and forth and present it to the, the city council, for instance. Uh, and, and they would argue some would be against it. And we'd have to try to persuade them this is what's necessary. And, and they would eventually have to have a public hearing and approve it. Wow. And in 92, that all went away. Cable got deregulated. And, and I think Congress rightly saw that, you know, the, where the future was going and the amounts of money it was going to take to get there. Uh, no one even in 92 could envision something like a roadrunner high-speed internet service. But they deregulated cable, and then we were free to, outside of our basic rate, which is the little rate for the 890 thing, uh, we were free to do what it took to run our business, and uh, which is what we do today. Uh, oh, you wanted to talk about 
uh, the, the different services that Time Warner has. Mm -hmm. Now, I only know of what, three or four, um, you know, with the, the Roadrunner and the, the cable and the telephone. Correct. Are there others? Well, one of the biggest things we, we developed recently is, is on-demand product. And whether you're watching movies or shows or primetime on-demand, I mean, my daughter was telling us about a show called Blacklist on CBS on Monday night. She said it's phenomenal. I had seen it, so I went through primetime on-demand, and my wife and I caught up the three episodes we missed. Now we're fervent fans. We watch it every Monday night. Uh, but that is the on-demand service all comes out of servers that are sitting in Binghamton. Uh, and, and at one time, we even serviced Jamestown out of Binghamton. So if you wanted to watch a movie on pay-per-view in Jamestown, you hit the button at the speed of light. We shot that movie across the fiber network out to Jamestown, and you watched your movie. So on-demand is huge. Uh, many, many channels now, whether they be movies, sports, whatever. Uh, and it, it's just been an interesting, interesting business. How, how many... And how big are the computers that hold all this? Servers are pretty pretty massive, yeah. uh, as you can imagine. It's, uh, it's a lot of bytes of, of data that yeah. are going out across the system. Um, and, and that's why people say, well, you know, all you do is collect money. Well, and, uh, we spend <laughs> a lot of money, too. We collect it, and we spend a lot. And the infrastructure, the capital expenditures are in, the, in just the local area, in the millions of dollars a year to keep the system running. I remember business. the first time I saw fiber optic. I couldn't believe that you could put sound and and video over that tiny, tiny little wire. All different colored lights, too. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I don't pretend to understand it. That's why we have engineers. Oh. But the only downside of it, it's phenomenal technology. But when it goes down, and I'll talk to the summer before last, the 201 bridge, truck came out of there with, with his, uh, his lift up, took our fiber out right by Binghamton University. It took us nine hours to splice that fiber back together. You bring in a trailer, create slack, and they sit there with microscopes, and they splice each one of these pieces of glass back together. Painstaking words. Oh, yeah. It took nine hours to do it. It was just how amazing. They, the technology involved. How do they know which ones? It's like surgery. Are, yeah, you, you, yeah. Light in it, I guess they can tell by the colors of the light trying to coming from each end, because we got redundancy, so you can feed from both ends. They look at the different colors of light and they, they put it back together just like a surgeon would put, you know, the nerves back together and then and a hand reattachment. You've been involved in how, how many years now? Thirty six. Thirty six years. And a half. You've been involved in a lot. <laughs> and don't forget that. And a half. You've been involved in a lot, a lot of things in the community. Mm -hmm. Talk about some of those. Well, you know, and, and Bob, I will say this: I was involved with you on a number of occasions uh -huh. where we did. The, the special one right. from Binghamton University, yeah. uh, and we did some even in the earlier days from what was uh, the IBM Country Club, yeah. and we would do this, the Special Olympics, and we'd, we'd shoot them live, Tom Lewis would come on, and, and you would help produce the program. But we've been involved in so many things. We've helped so many charities over the years, so many nonprofits, so many wonderful organizations. You can't count that high, and it's just been gratifying that, that a company would take its dollars and, and you know, really put it back into the community and help so many uh, wonderful organizations. It's just gratifying. What, uh, what organizations are you involved with personally? Well, let's see. I've been previously on the board of directors of the Urban League. I've been uh, uh, involved with, uh, oh my gosh, how many different ones are there? Uh, quite a few. I just, I just actually resigned my position from the Chamber of Government Affairs Committee because I'm no longer doing government affairs. In dealing with elected officials, I'm handling just franchising. So we have somebody else taking that role within the. Oh, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not involved with the government. Then. Well, it's interesting because the Chamber Government Affairs Committee really is more geared more toward elected officials uh -huh. and presenting the chamber's position on various laws, rules, unshackling the order, things of that nature. So I don't really do that anymore. So I'm not on that committee anymore. No. Uh, but I've been involved with it, just a bunch of them. Uh, uh, was involved with Chow for many years, ran the Chow Hunger Walk for a number of years, and, and I know uh, to this day Roger Neal and, and uh, MBF Radio does a fabulous job. Mm -hmm. Just had the Hunger Walk recently. Well, and in addition, in addition to being personally involved in the organization, company-wise, you in your position there, you supported lots and lots, and you still do. Yeah, we still do. Uh -huh. uh, I don't do it as much anymore, but yeah, we support, like, you just, you name it. And the nice thing about it, it was not only organizations it was right down to individual helping a little girl who's got cancer, who lives in Conklin, that's not yeah. Donating different services, gift certificates, helping out, uh, bringing food, whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, still get a big kick out of that. That's, uh, yeah. that's still uh, a good thing to do. I was 
talking with somebody, I believe it was one of these interviews, who said that not only is the business fun, but you get to do a lot of good for people and for organizations and, and for the community. You really do, and, and you don't wave the flag. I mean, we're not out there promoting it all. Oh, here's what we did, here's what we did. Uh, you know, one of my best friends in life is Nick Serafini, and, and Nick very quietly has done so much for so many people, and most people don't even know about it. Uh, and, and a lot of times people would recognize, I, I can tell you truthfully, that I've gone to uh, city council meetings and board meetings in different municipalities and people have said to me, you know, one of the reasons I don't mind paying your bill, I see the good you do in the community. And it's very gratifying to hear that, Bob. And it's yeah. just, uh, um, you know, people do recognize it. And again, we don't trump it on, I don't, you know, have a banner downtown that says we did this or that. Uh, you know, Ron Saul will call me quite frequently for help. Uh, with the July 4th celebration downtown or the tournament of bands or something going on downtown. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we just enjoy doing that. Well, well I, I come to figure, you used to support the, uh, the St. Patrick's Parade. St. Patrick's Day Parade. Year. I was on the parade committee, and, uh, yeah. you know, that's, a, that, that's just a fun, fun thing to do. Oh, and, yeah. And I'll tell you what, you want to get in, involved with a group of, of fun people's librarians. They're, yeah. uh, good. They're great souls. Well, with your Irish background. Right? <laughs> it was a natural. Yeah. It was a natural for me, you know. Uh, even though I don't drink uh, harp, I drink uh, Mick Ultras, but uh, uh, it, it, it's a great group of people. So I take it you're a member of the Hibernians. A member of the Hibernians, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a great organization. <laughs> and worked with a lot of great people there, Ed Green among them, and has been very active in local affairs as well. Talk about some of the other people you've met over the years. Let's yeah. see. Well, you know, it was interesting, Roger Neal, and I know yeah. you've done an interview with Roger, and, yeah. and I met Roger when I was the public address announcer, and he was... Long bus rides with the dusters in the dead of winter on slick highways, and he was doing the radio play-by-play, -play and uh, you know got to got to know Roger very well over the years. Uh, for many mornings, for many years, I was on the John Wesley Show oh. every morning at 7:25. The show up. we did a segment called On Cable Tonight, and I would call in, and John would put me on the air, and we'd discuss well tonight on HBO or tonight on MSG or whatever. Uh, John did a whole bunch of, of fun things over the years where. He would have, you know, barbecues at people's house at 6 in the morning, and I'd oh, go to yeah, those things. Yeah. Joe Sobel would come up from State College, Pennsylvania, yeah. and uh, we do live broadcasts, and uh, that was a lot of fun stuff. And I went to a bunch of Notre Dame football games every year. And when I was out at Notre Dame on that Friday, I would call into John's show from South Bend, Indiana, and do the live segment. Yeah. And uh, so I got to know John, worked with him for many, many years. Uh, and, and, uh, I'm Tony sure. Russell, whose real name isn't Russell, but Tony and I, uh, Tony was working at, at MBF at the time and helped. I'd sometimes I'd come in and pre-record segments and he'd record those for me. And for many years I went on Tony's talk show. Uh -huh. And uh, Tony only had one basic rule. He said, you can come on the show and you just can't see what the question is. I'll give you the name of the caller and where they're from. John from Binghamton, for instance. Famous name, by the way. Uh, but I would not. Tony would see what the question was. I would not, and I would take it blank. You know, it's interesting how that relationship evolved. Was Tony was taking us to task over a rate increase, day after day after day after day. So I finally called the station manager at the time, and I said, "Look, I said he's killing us here. I want an opportunity to respond." So he said, "Okay, I'll call you tomorrow." I said, "No, no, no, no. Let's do it this way. I want to look you in the eye. I prefer to do things face to face," and he agreed. And I sat down across from him for about an hour, and he's, we got done. He said, I still don't like your company or your increases, but I respect you for having the guts to come on because there are a lot of people that wouldn't. Well, over the years, we, we actually became friends over it. I was on the show many, many times uh, and really enjoyed talking to people about our business, and people were extremely respectful. You'd expect they'd get on screaming and yelling. They may disagree with you. They were, they were courteous. They were polite. Uh, and we got a lot done over the years, and I really enjoyed that. You brought up the public access channel. Mm -hmm. You've had quite a few experiences there. I have. Uh, public access is a different beast. The rules require that you can't edit, censure, or do anything to a public access show. And we've had some people over the years that have pushed the boundaries. Uh, just prior to uh, the Bush re-election campaign, we had we had a person put on a, a copyrighted movie that was not flattering to the then president. Uh, and I was getting calls at home, and that's another story, calls at home, okay. how people found me. But we were getting, you know, they, they couldn't run that program. We didn't have the copyright. Uh, we had another public access program that was very threatening toward President Bush. 
two days later, I had a man and a woman in black suits sitting in my office asking for the name, the address, the contact information, and a copy of the tape. And when they talk about the Secret Service and they don't smile, they don't smile. They don't smile. They don't smile. They're deadly serious. Right. Excuse the word on this anniversary of the President Kennedy assassination, but they are very focused individuals. Uh, and they had a, I, they had a conversation with the gentleman. He never put another program on like that again. Um, we've had some people that push the boundaries in terms of sexuality and nudity, um, one of which we took off. She was very unhappy we took it off. Uh, it was, you know, a picture of the male gentilian, and uh, it was not flattering. Uh, we took the show off. We stood our ground. Uh, we did not run the program again. So it's, uh, they want to push the envelope a little bit. It can serve a great number of religious programs. I met some really wonderful people putting religious programming on. But it, it can, it's a double-edged sword. It can be... Uh, it can cut both ways. It can, it can be very informative. Uh, it can be great, and we've had some others not so much. So, uh, we're talking about the, the copyright mm -hmm. program. Uh, did Time Warner get sued? No. No. Every every person that runs public access certifies on a form that they will seek and will have gained all copyright releases uh -huh. prior to running the program. So the onus is on the producer. By pub by federal rules. You cannot come back on Time Warner for something a public access producer runs. I see. It's all on the producer to have obtained the appropriate copyright releases. So do you recall what the outcome was of the uh, uh, running the movie? They, uh, a number of letters, We I got copies of the letters that were sent to the producer telling them, telling that person to cease and desist, that they did not have the rights. And it was interesting, the guy who made the program, who I do not like, personally, the guy who, not the guy who aired it, the guy who made the movie said, we must get this out. We must defeat Bush. You must get this aired. Uh -huh. He had already sold the rights to a production house. He didn't even hold the rights. He couldn't tell people. He said, well, the producer gave us the rights. No, he didn't because he doesn't own them anymore. So that was stipulated in the letter from these high But this was not attorneys. locally produced. No, this it, it, was a, it was a movie, a national movie. Okay, but it was a local, somebody local. Local, that, put it on our access it on, channel. On our that is correct. That is uh, correct. Uh, Let's talk about the, the, the unlisted number that Dave Whelan currently has. Uh, which one? My unlisted number. Oh, My number yeah, was listed okay. for years, yeah. David Whelan. Uh -huh. And we would get calls, and I'll tell you when it started, Iron Mike Tyson. We'd have these pay-per-views that people would pay like 30 bucks for. Uh -huh. And Tyson would knock the guy out in, you know, 47 seconds. <laughs> and, and by the time the fight came out, it was usually late. And as Rush Limbaugh would say, numerous adult beverages had been consumed. <laughs> they would call me up. At 11, 12 o'clock at night, just screaming, terrible language. And if my wife answered first, she would hear it, just foul, foul, foul. Oh, I'm not paying the effing bill, you this and that, and slam the phone down. And after probably three or four different occasions where fights ended prematurely, so to speak, uh -huh. she said, we got to change the number. So we did. I, uh... I've never said this, <laughs> but many years ago when I was doing a talk show, and I, I have an idea, anybody that's, anybody that's ever done a talk show has had death threats. Okay. And, uh, and so the way I handled it, I just put an answering machine on it. I uh, don't recall ever got a death threat on an answering machine. <laughs> and I don't recall ever, nobody's ever threatened to kill me, thank goodness. Uh, I they told me, you know, call me some really bad names. Well, you never did it. Said bad things about my mom. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But, you know, speaking of your job, I used to listen to that a lot when I was in the car. And I remember Johnny Nuzella's dad oh, used to call right. you every single day. <laughs> yeah. What a, what, and he actually lived kind of, uh, he was one block behind where my mom lived at the yeah. time on Thorpe Street. And I, Johnny Nuzella was a friend of my brother, and I knew John well. And I remember he would call you M. Oh. What a what a wonderful guy. Yeah, well, the the thing about him, they they nicknamed him uh, Bullwinkle. Bullwinkle, that is correct. Because uh, uh, he supposed he said I won't call him Mister Know It All, but I'll call him Bullwinkle. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing about that man was, you never knew what he was going to say. Never knew. He one day. He worked for the newspaper. I think he did. Uh, I think he was an independent contractor. I think he was a photographer. I used to run into him. Going he was yesterday. a photographer. That is correct. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I remember one time when he he uh, went to a, a Cuomo news conference. Okay. And he said, "Governor, let me ask you a question." <laughs> I remember how he used to talk. Let me ask you a question. 
Did your wife make good spaghetti? <laughs> And those of you who didn't know Mr. Roselli, he was just a little beaver oh, yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. he was like a finger or something. Uh, yeah, he was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was. But he was—he was, he he was, was a, a character. character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It goes back right. a few years, my friend. Yeah, yeah well, it's one of these days I probably ought to do a program on the talk show. You know? Some of the characters, because you had people oh. that would call on it. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. especially yeah. early on with it, when it was. Uh, you, know, you talked about you have to make money with it. Mm -hmm. Well, then when I started to get readings. Then, then there was a little more pressure in you know? and um, but we did it for what seven, seven, eight years. Yeah, a long time. That was it. Was fun. It really was. Yeah, fun. It was interesting. Well, interesting, <laughs> interesting folk in our area. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I don't know how long we've gone. Dude. I don't either. But, uh, it's been yeah. It's really been fun. Did you have any any? Is there anything that I didn't ask you about that you thought you might want to share? Well. Um, I am president of the Notre Dame Club of the Triple City, so if you're a Notre Dame fan and would like to join the club, give me a call. Oh, uh, how did you get to, wait a minute, how did you, you would think you'd be president of the Oswego Well, you'd club. think so, but no, <laughs> I've, I've been a fervent Notre Dame fan since 1963, I attended my first Notre Dame game in person in 1971, I uh, have been going ever since, just a huge Notre Dame fan, and now, each year I take my brother and, and my son-in-law, my two boys, there's a group of eight of us that goes every year, I run a condo, and Fly, fly the boys in. Oh, I drive because my brother's definitely afraid of flying, so I actually drive him out every year. And this year may be the last because on our way back from the Oklahoma game, which Notre Dame lost, by the way, which made me not very happy, <laughs> we pulled off to get gas in Geneva, Ohio, got back on, ready to get back on the expressway, uh, waiting at a red light, and we're rear-ended by a drunk driver. At quarter of three in the afternoon, the woman was hammered, uh, could hardly walk. And so we got home kind of late that night, and about seven thousand dollars damage to my son's car. Oh, he was a pathfinder. He said, "No more trips for you, Dad." Oh, yeah. I think next year I'll be like flying. It was your fault. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, was, and I was sitting in the passenger seat. So that, that's my anecdotal. Uh, yeah. But I'm just a big Notre Dame fan. And How far in advance do you have to order tickets? You can't order tickets. Oh, you you have to be a contributing alumni who donates to the university every year, and and then you get an application to apply in a lottery. And I have several friends of mine, uh, Dr. Joe Hogan. But I trust being one of them who gets me tickets every single year. He's done that for, for eons, and he's, he's a dear friend. And it was Joe that wanted to resurrect the Notre Dame Club of the Triple Cities that was founded in the late 1930s by his dad. Yeah. Uh, and Joe said, come on, you, you've got a lot of energy. You could be the president. So for the last couple of years, I've been the president. I work with some great people, uh, Bill and Mary Ann Benedict and Dr. Hogan. It's just great. How, uh, uh, how many people? We just had a, our, our annual, just had, in July, we have a Universal Notre Dame night we had down here at Nurchies and Endicott, and we had 42 people uh, at, at the dinner. Our speaker was the, the director of bands from the University of Notre Dame, did a great talk, had a great dinner. So we're looking to increase membership. Um, on paper, there's 300. How many people actually show up to a meeting? Uh, you know, they're all getting a little longer in the tooth, Bob, as yeah, we all are. Yeah. So it's getting tougher for a lot of them to get out. But uh, big Notre Dame fan, love it. Just love it. You had said before, you don't know what's in the future for you. No, I'm not quite sure. Do you, uh, you plan to, to stay in, in your position as long as you can? Well, it's a couple of things. As long as I enjoy what I'm doing, which I do, as long as I can continue to, to handle the travel and what I do, as long as I remain in good health. Uh, you know, I'm, and as people have probably figured out, I'm a type A. I've got, I'm like a shark. You stop moving, you die. Uh -huh. So I've got to have something else to do. My son has his own business, being up in Hots in downtown that I help him with. Uh, a young guy, and maybe uh, when I do retire, I just go to work for him. It'll be more of a voluntary position. <laughs> I won't be paid for sure. Uh, but I, you know, a couple more years at least. Yeah, a couple oh, more years. What, what's your What's your son's place? Binghamton Hots, it's called. It's uh, it, for those who followed Food Network and know about this place in Rochester. Nick Traho has created the garbage plate, and Nick Traho's garbage plate has a little bit of everything on it. It's It's a late night staple in Rochester. Rich David had the idea here in Binghamton. Uh, just became mayor of Binghamton. It was his idea. He's from Rochester to bring it and have a late night eatery here in downtown. Uh, but he was tied up with a lot of things, so my son David ended up uh, doing the business instead. And it's open till 3.30 in the morning on Friday and Saturday nights and 1 o'clock in the morning every other night. And they serve garbage plates late at night and great lunches during the day. Where, where is it? It's 138 Washington Street, 128 Washington Street, right across from the Salvation Army and right behind the bars that are the strip on State Street, uh -huh. right through the... the Real nice uh, area there, the park-like area. He's right in the corner of it. So I assume they got some big TV sets with 
sports on them. They got they do a lot of sports. He doesn't serve alcohol. Especially Notre Dame. By the time they get there, they've had enough they to don't drink. Need it. No, they don't. But uh, so I like to help my wife, and I clean it on Sundays. And I think when I do retire, I'll help David, and I'll feel branch out and do a couple. I more. really appreciate you coming over. Oh, it was my pleasure. Talking with me, David, and, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you again. I hope so. Good Lord willing, people say good to see you, and I say at my age, it's good to be seen. There you go. Thank Thanks, you, David. My pleasure. You must remember this, a kiss is still a kiss, a sigh is just a sigh, the fundamental things apply as time goes by, and when two lovers woo, they still say I love you, and that you can rely.